So nitric oxide is what we call a vasodilator, meaning that it's when activated either by shear stress, so when we start to exercise, then that signals the, the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels to dilate. And so when we dilate the blood vessels, you actually can get more oxygen, more nutrient delivery downstream to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. Dr. Nathan Bryan, an international leader in molecular medicine. So if you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide, then you, you don't vasodilate. So you basically lose the regulation of blood flow. And the best example is sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction in both men and women. Understand how the human body produces nitric oxide, understand what goes wrong in people that can't make it. Then and only then could we really start to develop rational therapies that get to the root cause of, of most chronic diseases. But interestingly enough, if there's dysfunction in the vascular bed of the sex organs, that same dysfunction occurs in the heart, in the blood vessels of the brain, the kidney, the liver, the lungs. It's systemic disease. The other problem is the you know, people who use mouthwash to eradicate the oral microbiome may be getting a good diet, but they've lost the ability to utilize nitrate to produce nitroproxide. And then thirdly, Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I like to talk health, well-being and self-improvement in this space every Monday and Thursday, where I'm joined by many of the world's leading experts who lend their experience and knowledge to the conversation. So if that piques your interest, well then please like, subscribe, share with other people who might find value in these discussions too. And do leave the podcast a positive rating, three, four, five stars, as many of you have already done to date. You can do so on iTunes and on Spotify. Indeed, on Spotify, you can also watch the videos of these episodes now too, as you can already do so over on YouTube and on Instagram. So if you'd like to become subscribers over on those platforms as well, that would be fantastic. Now, very interesting discussion lined up for you today about a molecule that we really all should know more about. That molecule is nitric oxide. Do you use mouthwash? Do you use antibiotics over a long period of time? What about antacids? Well, if so, this will certainly be a very interesting discussion for you. As I'm joined by Dr. Nathan Bryan, who was recruited by the Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Ferit Murad, to research nitric oxide, a molecule with an enormous potential to prevent disease. In this episode, we discuss what nitric oxide is and why it's so significant in the human body, we hear the role it plays in optimal cardiovascular function and how an inefficient cardiovascular system negatively affects other body systems, including sexual and cognitive function. We hear about the relationship diet plays in respect of nitric oxide, plus we hear the role of the amino acid L-arginine in the formation of nitric oxide in the body. Discover why you should not be using mouthwash, antibiotics over the long term or antacids, we hear about the surprising first signs of nitric oxide deficiency, plus expect to learn how we can optimize nitric oxide production in our bodies through our diet and our behaviors. Well, Dr. Nathan Bryan, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. The subject of nitric oxide is uh, such a fascinating one. It's, it's so important from a health perspective. Uh, but a very underappreciated one at the same time. If I can just put things into context for listeners and for viewers, um, Dr. Valentin Fuster, he's one of the world's leading cardiologists who you will know. He is at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. He said the discovery of nitric oxide was one of the most important in the history of cardiovascular medicine, which by extension means it's really one of the most important discoveries in all of medicine. Now, this didn't happen centuries ago. Uh, this really only happened in recent decades. And... Uh, as early back as, what, 1998, three pharmacologists won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of nitric oxide, the molecule. And I believe you actually w work with one of those doctors, Dr. Ferid Murad. Um, I'm interested to find out at the outset, was it the sheer potential of the disease prevention that nitric oxide research presented to you that drew you to nitric oxide, I think, in the first place? Yeah, you know, it, it's been a fascinating journey. But uh, yeah, first of all, thanks thanks for having me on and, and having this very important discussion. But yeah, so in, when I got started in this field, in, uh, right after the Nobel Prize had been awarded, you know, the scientific community knew how important this was and it 
the, the famous quote by Dr. Fuster really revealed that there was still a lot of promise for nitric oxide. So the scientific and medical community knew that nitric oxide was a gas naturally produced that regulated a number of physiological processes. But when I got involved, number one, we didn't know how to detect nitric oxide deficiency. In fact, even in the research environment, we couldn't detect nitric oxide at levels that were produced in the human body, right? Because it's a very potent molecule. And when it's produced in the body, it's so very low levels that we had a hard time kind of analyzing or detecting kind of its rate of production and its flux in biological systems. So that's really when I got started in the field. I was uh, working on a PhD in molecular and cellular physiology, and I was charged with developing analytical methods where we could detect nitric oxide and nitric oxide metabolites in different organ systems. And then our whole thought process was if we could create a fingerprint of enobiology in different diseases, then we could kind of work backwards and figure out what goes wrong in these disease processes that leads to these prognostic or diagnostic metabolites. And then once we understood that, then we could develop rational therapies. Uh, so that that's kind of been the whole strategy and approach in my research lab and independent uh, investigator career was understand how the human body produces nitric oxide, understand what goes wrong in people that can't make it. Then and only then could we really start to develop rational therapies that get to the root cause of, of most chronic diseases. Okay, we'll come to those therapies shortly, but if we can just break it down for people and uh, contextualize it for people who are listening who are not familiar with nitric oxide. You mentioned it's a gas, it's ubiquitous, it's in literally every cell uh, across the human body. Why is it so important? Well, the, when the Nobel uh, Committee basically decided to award a Nobel Prize for the discovery of nitric oxide, I think what they described in their announcement was that signaling by a gas it's produced by one cell and penetrates another cell is a completely new paradigm in cell signal. So prior to that, you know, the best example is hormone signaling, right? We've got a kind of a lock and key type. This this receptor on a cell recognizes this interaction, it's ligand, it activates intracellular signaling, but nitric oxide's a gas. It just freely diffuses across that cell membrane, uh, binds its targets inside the cell, activates second messenger systems. Uh, but the what are, what are the challenges with that? Number one, how do we know, how do we dictate specificity and selectivity when you've got a gas that just diffuses in all three dimensions and can bind the different uh, receptors and activate? Today, we understand that. Uh, and two, it's so potent that you don't need a lot of nitric oxide to activate a lot of these signaling mechanisms. So the, the challenge for us has been, how do we deliver for nitric oxide gas in the human body safely and effectively that recapitulates what would be produced endogenously. Because we want to understand the mechanism of disease, what goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide, and then give nitric oxide, but more importantly, fix the reason your body can't make it. And that's what we've done that really no one else has been able to do. And, you know, I did this, as you mentioned earlier, working under the direction of Fred Murad. He was my department chair for, for a number of years, and we had a drug discovery program at the Institute of Molecular Medicine, which really started the old field of nitric oxide-based therapeutics. We'll come to the exogenous sources that you're working on as far as nitric oxide is concerned in a second, but if we can just uh, go back again to the uh, its role in cardiovascular function in particular, uh, I'm curious uh, just to outline for, for listeners and viewers what bodily functions are negatively affected uh, by an inefficient uh, cardiovascular system and impaired nitric oxide production. Well, it first manifests itself in the cardiovascular system. So nitric oxide is what we call a vasodilator, meaning that it's when activated either by shear stress, so when we start to exercise, or endogenous agonist uh, like acetylcholine or, or other activators, then that signals the, the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels to dilate. And so when we dilate the blood vessels, you actually can get more oxygen, more nutrient delivery downstream to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. So if you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide, then you you don't dilate, you don't vasodilate. So you basically lose the regulation of blood flow. And the best example is sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction in both men and women. Because in order for an erection to occur, and this is both a penile erection or a clitoral erection in women, you have to get dilation of the blood vessels. And the dilation of the blood vessels comes from the production of nitric oxide. So in a healthy person with normal sexual function, if we're stimulated, that 
produces nitric oxide in the sex organs. We get engorgement, and that causes an erection in men and women. But if we can make nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessels, then we, be, we may become stimulated. But if you can't produce nitric oxide, you don't get vasodilation, you don't get engorgement, and by definition, that's sexual dysfunction. But interestingly enough, if, if there's dysfunction in the vascular bed of the sex organs, that same dysfunction occurs in the, in the heart, in the blood vessels of the brain, the kidney, the liver, the lungs. It's systemic disease because we have to regulate blood flow to certain regions of the body at specific times. So if we're trying to recall memory and have a test or figure out where we left our car keys, we've got to open up the blood supply to the prefrontal cortex, which activates memory recall. But if the blood vessels can make nitric oxide, we can improve blood flow and we develop mild cognitive disorders, vascular dementia, and Alzheimer's. If we begin to exercise, we need to increase blood supply to the heart to meet the increased metabolic demands on the heart. And we do that through vasodilation. So if the blood vessels of the heart can't produce nitric oxide to dilate the coronary arteries, we get angina or ischemic pain, and we, can, we get short of breath. And that's really diagnostic for ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease. And then if you can't make nitric oxide to dilate the systemic blood vessels, now you've got the same volume of blood going through smaller pipes, which causes an increase in pressure. And that's an increase in blood pressure. And two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure, which, by the way, is the number one risk factor for the number one killer worldwide, which is cardiovascular disease. So when we think about, and, and you, you know, I always think about this quote you started with, that the discovery of nitric oxide is the most important in the history of cardiovascular medicine. 25 years later, 26 years later, still holds true. Because when you lose the ability to produce nitric oxide, that's the earliest event in the onset of progression of cardiovascular disease, which remains the number one killer worldwide, which to me is unacceptable. We know how to diagnose it. We know what symptoms lead to cardiovascular disease, and we know how to fix it. Okay, so let's look at nitric oxide and uh, how we uh, derive it and how we get nitric oxide. I believe there are two pathways, one involving the amino acid L-arginine, and then the other way is then via diet. And then the third way will be the other exogenous way that we'll come to uh, lately in relation to the products that, he, that uh, y y you produce. Can you talk to me about those initial pathways involving L-arginine and then uh, via diet then as well? Yeah, so the first pathway to be discovered was the arginine pathway. And this really led to the discovery of an enzyme that today we call nitric oxide synthase. And this enzyme, you know, there are three isoforms. There's one that's produced in the endothelial cells. We call that ENOS or NOS3. There's one that's induced upon uh, a cytokine storm or inflammation or infection. We call that NOS2 or an inducible isoform. And then there's one that's found in the neurons in our brain. We call that NOS1 or, or NNOS. But it, we, we also understand that these are ubiquitous enzymes. So the ENOS is, not, is found outside of the endothelium. ENOS is found outside of, of neurons. And there was a series of discoveries, really by many independent groups, that really completely elucidated the pathway. So today we understand that arginine is, binds to this enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. And through eight different cofactors and substrates, this provides electrons that really provide the five electron oxidation of arginine to nitric oxide. Now, biochemically, that's a very complex, complicated reaction, but suffice it to say, we know enzymatically how nitric oxide is produced from arginine. And now the challenge for us is there's people don't become nitric oxide deficient because they run out of arginine. So supplementing arginine never made sense biochemically as a means to improve nitric oxide production. Because the rate-limiting step in this enzymatic reaction is oxidation of a molecule called tetrahydrobiopterin. And it's one of these essential cofactors that's needed to provide electrons for this five-electron oxidation. So the, the problem is the arginine can bind to the NOS enzyme, but if it's uncoupled and you don't have the proper flow of electrons, then you don't get nitric oxide out at the other end. So giving more arginine does not fix the problem. In fact, it can exacerbate the problem because that enzyme will now reduce molecular oxygen to superoxide, cause more oxidative stress, more NOS uncoupling, more oxidation of BH4, and you exacerbate the condition you're trying to fix. So today we understand that we can restore the function of the enzyme, we can prevent BH4 oxidation, which is what my technology does, and we can fix and recouple the NOS enzyme. 
So now the amount of arginine that's produced within the cell can bind, activate nitric oxide synthase, lead to nitric oxide production. Arginine, you get citrulline as a byproduct. Citrulline is recycled through the urea cycle. And now the cell uses that arginine that comes from citrulline, complete recycling, very efficient system. So that's first. And when the enzyme becomes uncoupled, we call that endothelial dysfunction. So the endothelial cells no longer have the capacity to produce nitric oxide. And that's the underlying dysfunction we see in erectile dysfunction, blood hypertension, uh, Alzheimer's, metabolic disease. So it's the dysfunction of the enzyme that now we know how to fix and recouple. And then the second pathway, which is discovered uh, maybe in the 90s, was through the presence of oral bacteria that utilize nitrate that comes from our diet, specifically green leafy vegetables. And nitrate is inert in humans, so we have to have the bacteria to activate this molecule into nitrite and nitric oxide. So number one, we have to get enough nitrate from our diet. We need 300 to 400 milligrams per day. The Western diet is not providing enough nitrate because the, the food we grow in America is deficient in most nutrients, including nitrate. Um, the other problem is you know, people who use mouthwash eradicate the oral microbiome, maybe getting a good diet, but they've lost the ability to utilize nitrate to produce nitric oxide. The other problem is fluoride. Fluoride in toothpaste, fluoride in mouthwash, fluoride in dental rinses. Fluoride's an antiseptic that kills all the good bacteria. So again, you could be eating the right foods, you could be eating a straight vegetarian diet, but if you're using mouthwash or have fluoride in your toothpaste, you're getting no nitric oxide benefits from that diet. And then thirdly, you need stomach acid for this pathway to work. And there's 200 million prescriptions written in the U.S. every year for antacids. That's not even counting the over-the-counter purchases. If you shut down stomach acid production, you completely inhibit nitric oxide production. You can't absorb nutrients. You can't absorb magnesium, which is needed to make nitric oxide. You can't absorb iron, which is needed to make nitric oxide. Uh, you can't absorb zinc, uh, chromium, iodine, selenium, B vitamins. So your body becomes nutrient deficient. And then not only do you become nitric oxide deficient, other biochemical pathways become compromised and people get sick. So what we try to do is stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production, start doing the things that promote it. Your body can produce nitric oxide and people get better. And then when all else fails, then we have products that do it for you. Wow, there's so much to talk about there. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> 40, a... 40 years and four minutes. <laughs> exactly. Um, a few things that are going to stand out to people there. You mentioned mouthwash. Now, what is it in mouthwash that is bad for the bacteria? It causes, dysbio it causes dysbiosis of the microbiome in the, in the mouth. That's right. So the, now that the microbiome project's completely mapped out, and we know that the bacteria that live in and on our body outnumber our own human cells 10 to 1. So this is a true symbiotic relationship, meaning that the bacteria that reside in and on our body are doing things that are good for the host, the human host. Right? They do things that the human body can do. So when we eradicate the microbiome, we get systemic disease. And I think you know, the field saw enormous advances forward when you could cure things like H. pylori by doing fecal transplants. You could eradicate a lot of autoimmune disease simply by focusing on restoring the function of the bacteria. So there's a reason we don't take antibiotics every day for the rest of our life because of the known collateral damage by not only killing the pathogens that are targeted, but you kill the, the non-pathogenic commensal bacteria. The same thing happens with mouthwash. You know, when you see the commercials of Listerine killing 99.99% of the bacteria, you should believe that because that's a true statement, but it's not a good statement. In fact, you should, you should specifically avoid Listerine because of what it's telling you kills 99.99% of the oral bacteria. And when you do that, what we're finding is that your blood pressure goes up, you get erectile dysfunction, you lose the protective benefits of exercise, all because it's shutting down nitric oxide production. So if you just stop using mouthwash, which two out of three Americans use mouthwash, and we published this back in 2009, that we could make people clinically hypertensive just by giving them seven days of mouthwash. And there's this whole concept called resistant hypertension. And what does that mean? That if you have high blood pressure, you go to your doctor, he prescribes you a blood pressure medicine. But yet 50% of the people that are prescribed blood pressure medicine don't respond with better blood pressure. 
It's because they fail to recognize that the microbiome is contributing to the regulation of systemic blood pressure. And when you kill these bacteria with, with mouthwash, with fluoride in your toothpaste, uh, then you're disrupting nitric oxide production, leading to an increase in blood pressure. So now what we're finding is that people who have resistant hypertension and we start to interrogate them and ask questions, do you use mouthwash? Yes, we'll stop. Do you have fluoride in your toothpaste? Yes, we'll get rid of it. Now, within two weeks, your blood pressure is normal. You get people off prescription medication and now their body can self-regulate. I mean, it's I, it's the most profound observations and I think progress in clinical medicine over the past hundred years. Truly extraordinary. I heard you give a, a recent stat which shocked me in relation to people using antacids for even the, the medium term, never mind the long term, but uh, antacid yeah. use was linked to a 40% increase in stroke and heart attacks. Not an increased risk, but an actual event. Now, that's right. I and mean, it gets even better. Those were data from 2015 uh, that people have been on PPIs, and these are things like Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium, Omeprazole, Pentoprazole. These drugs completely shut down nitric oxide production. And people who had been on these drugs for three to five years, 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. And just last year, I think in September, there was a separate independent study published showing that people who had been on these drugs for at least, I think, four years had a 40% increase in onset of Alzheimer's. I mean, and all this can be explained. So what I like to do is take important clinical observations. And there's nothing more important than taking observations of people who have been on one spec, uh, correcting for all of the confounders. You take these drugs for three to five years, 40% higher incidence of heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's. So those are undisputable clinical observations. Now, it's our job as a scientific community to work backwards and figure out mechanistically why is that happening? Why are we seeing these clinical observations? And if we can understand that scientifically, now we can employ steps and strategies to prevent that. So now it's clear mechanistically that these drugs are completely inhibiting nitric oxide production from both pathways. These drugs cause an increase in ADMA, which is an inhibitor of the enzymatic production of nitric oxide from the NOS enzyme, and it shuts down nitric oxide production from our diet from swallowing your own saliva. So these are very dangerous drugs. They should be taken off the market. They're more dangerous than the Celebrex and Vioxx COX-2 inhibitors you know, that were taken off the market in the early 2000s because of the increased heart attack and stroke. These drugs are, are far more dangerous and should be discontinued. And if not, patients should get off of them because they're, they're causing death and destruction. When it comes to consuming products to help us increase our levels of nitric oxide, you have been very critical of nitrate products that are available out there and mm -hmm. also nitric oxide products. Can you talk to us why you don't like these products, and then talk to us about your own product and how it differs from the ones that are on the market currently. Well, number one, we know how to make nitric oxide, and we know how to correct endogenous nitric oxide deficiency in patients. So nitrate is not the answer. Arginine is not the answer. So what we, because if we give arginine and the enzyme is uncoupled, then as we discussed, you're not going to get a benefit. If we provide nitrate, as most people get from their vegetables, and you don't have the right oral bacteria or stomach acid, then you're not going to get a nitric oxide benefit. So what we do is all of our products produce nitric oxide when we give it to the consumer. And it's, we're not relying on the bacteria. We're not relying on stomach acid. We're not relying on the, the function of the enzyme. So if your body can't make nitric oxide, then our products do it for you. We do this in the form of a lozenge that slowly dissolves over five minutes and liberates nitric oxide gas. That lozenge restores the oral microbiome, fixes the enzyme in the lining of the blood vessel, now improves the body's ability to make nitric oxide on itself. And then we do this in a fermented beet powder. We pre-convert the nitrate found in beets into a usable form of nitrite so we don't rely on the bacteria. Uh, and we put this in water, you take it as a shot. And then we've created a topical line of products, a dual chamber nitric oxide, that when you combine these two components that generate nitric oxide gas, you apply it to the skin, improves blood flow, to the skin, where all other nitric oxide products on the market are giving your body precursors or substrates, and these companies cross their fingers, close their eyes, and hope that your body can convert it to nitric oxide. But the physiological basis for nitric oxide deficiency is the inability to utilize these 
precursors or substrates to make nitric oxide. So 99% of the products out there that are marketed as nitric oxide products don't do anything. And furthermore, there are companies selling gummies and chews that, I mean, cannot produce nitric oxide. The last thing we need in the American diet is, or in any diet for that matter, is more sugar. And these gummies and chews are, are laden with sugar. They can, actually, they destroy the microbiome. They glycate the NOS enzyme, and anything delivered in a sugar matrix, whether it's gummies or chews, actually lead to a, insufficient nitric oxide production. And so you have to avoid gummies, chews, beet products, nitrate-based products, and stop doing the things that disrupt, start doing the things that promote it, and then our products do it for you. As a matter of interest, if you were taking those lozenges and you had high blood pressure, how quickly or and how a short a period of time could you see a, a decrease in your level of uh, your systolic or systolic or a diastolic blood pressure? Yeah, well, we have actual clinical data where we've monitored this. So typically, within 20 minutes of taking the lozenge, you'll start to see, in many cases, a, a normalization or supporting a healthy blood pressure. And so let me just... The, the CYA statement is the products we have on the market today are dietary supplements not intended to treat, prevent, cure any disease. So what we do is we provide components that support the normal structure and function of the human body. We do this through nitric oxide. So if your body can't make it, we do it for you, but we basically provide support to recouple the NOS enzyme, restore the oral microbiome, supporting the normal structure and function of the body. Now, aside from that, I've got a, a drug company where we're specifically going for drug application and approval for drug therapy for specific indications like ischemic heart disease, like Alzheimer's, a topical drug for diabetic and non-healing wounds. So in that part of our business, in the, in the drug company, we will make specific disease claims and give physicians now a safe and effective drug to prescribe for their patients. But the consumer products, I think, you know, I think are just as important, if not more important, because these are readily accessible to everybody around the globe, and you can be proactive instead of reactive and start to employ strategies and start the products today to prevent this related age-related decline in nitric oxide production and before you get sick and before you need prescription medication. Is it inevitable that there will be a decrease in nitric oxide production in the body over time? No, not necessarily. And again, I, I use the my own N equal one very important experiment right, on this. So I turned 50 in November, but I've got the vascular age of a 32-year-old. You know, and we see people that are 20, 25 years old that have the vascular age and the nitric oxide production of a normal 80-year-old. So today, again, we understand what leads to nitric oxide deficiency, and we can employ strategies to prevent that age-related decline. But it takes work. You know, you you have to work at it. you got to change your diet. you got to change your lifestyle, and you've got to be deliberate. Uh, about what we're doing. Look, it's hard work if you're sick and trying to get better, and it's hard work trying not to get sick. So the point is you're going to have to work hard no matter what, but I think the, the work we put in is better well served at being proactive and preventing disease than, than getting sick and, and working hard and trying to reverse it or treat it. Uh, it just makes more sense and it's more efficient and more cost effective to be proactive instead of reactive. Well, talk to me about some of those proactive measures, the behavioral changes that you actually outline on your terrific website, by the way. Uh, one of them, as we've mentioned already, is in relation to maintaining good oral hygiene and that uh, oral dysbiosis that, uh, that uh, we, we spoke about earlier and uh, then the antiseptic mouthwash. But you're also promoting exercise and uh, dietary changes also in terms of the uh, leafy uh, grains that people should be eating more of. Yeah. Now, look, the first thing we always want to employ is if, is let the body work. <clears throat> if we do the right things, then the body heals itself. We just got to get out of the way. <clears throat> so what does that look like? I tell people the first thing you start with is stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production. Get rid of mouthwash. Get rid of fluoride in your toothpaste. If you're taking antacids, you have to, you have to stop. I mean, there's really no question about it. Now your body's actually primed to be able to produce nitric oxide. But there are things we can do to, to activate it, to stimulate it, to help it along. One is moderate physical exercise. <clears throat> as little as 20 to 30 minutes of exercise per day. Again, 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise. Just getting your heart rate up, sweating a little bit, deep breathing through your nose, out through your mouth. <clears throat> then diet. Stop eating processed foods. Eliminate sugar from your diet. Throw in some more green leafy vegetables. And then 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight a day or infrared sauna. 
those certain wavelengths and frequencies we get from the sun stimulate, activate nitric oxide, release nitric oxide. So those are three things. You can uh, exercise outside, expose your body to the sun, and sweat. Then 20 or 30 minutes, you've accomplished all three of those. You've gotten sunlight, you've increased your, uh, uh, your physical activity, you've started sweating, and your body is producing nitric oxide. So it's really that simple. And then, you know, we got products that actually can help facilitate that. Or if your body can do it, we do it for you. It's really a fascinating subject. As I said at the outset, nitric oxide is very much underappreciated. And I know that's the source of frustration to you. And that's probably uh, your motivation for speaking with me today in order to help to get the message out to, to a bigger audience. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the frustrations of these other companies out there <clears throat> that are selling so-called nitric oxide products that, you know, with the intent of, of creating <clears throat> profits with that and doing the, their customers are really disservice. And for me, who's been in this field for 25 years in the basic sciences, and even clinical translation of the science, it could kill an entire field. And as you, we talked about, nitric oxide is so critical that I think it's a game changer in healthcare and medicine. And the, the, the perfect example is I get, I, you know, we'll, we'll both get lots of comments back from this interview and people go, oh, Nathan, I tried the nitric oxide product and it didn't do anything for me. And that's dangerous. Because what they're doing is they bought one of these products that's marketed as a nitric oxide product when it cannot and will not work based on the underlying science and biochemistry. But the interpretation from that customer is, well, nitric oxide didn't work for me because that you know, that product didn't work for you because that's not a nitric oxide product. When people start doing things that restore nitric oxide production or taking my products that actually produce nitric oxide, they always see the benefit. And so the frustration is, providing the education information so cons consumers can make informed choices and start buying products that produce nitric oxide. And when they do that, they'll see the benefit of it and it'll prevent a dying industry. Because when people take products that don't produce nitric oxide, but their market is nitric oxide, the interpretation was nitric oxide doesn't work. And then it'll just fade and, and wane off and you know, it'll cost billions of lives. Because uh, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that nitric oxide uh, will affect, it'll be how we treat patients for the next hundred years and even beyond because there's not a single disease where nitric oxide at the right dose at the right time in the right patient wouldn't be beneficial. Whether it's heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, kidney disease, pulmonary disease, nitric oxide addresses the root cause of all those. Uh, Dr. Brian, if people want to find out more about your book, Functional Nitric Oxide Nutrition, which is available on Amazon, I know, and on your website, uh, where can people go to find out more about you and, and your products beyond your book? Well, the first thing I do is send people to the educational website, uh, Dr. Nathan S. Brian. I'm not selling you anything to here. I do a monthly blog. Really try to provide the science, up-to-date science, on, so you can now take that information and develop kind of a personal regimens, what's best for you to restore nitric oxide. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel. I encourage people to subscribe. I will post this on the YouTube channel where they can become informed and educated. It's Dr. Nathan S. Bryan, Nitric Oxide on YouTube. Uh, I'm searchable by most search engines. Uh, and then those, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Dr. Nathan S. Bryan. And then for those who are interested specifically in the product technology, it's www.n101.com. That's the letter N, the number one, the letter O, the number one, dot com, N101.com. Great stuff. And I'll pop a link to all, all of those websites and links in the show notes for this episode. But for the moment, Dr. Nathan Bryant, thank you so much. A fascinating conversation. Thank you for having me. Look forward to continued discussions. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you enjoyed it or indeed any of the previous episodes and you've not already done so, please like, subscribe, share with other people who you think might get value from tuning in also and do leave the podcast a positive rating. Until next time, stay happy.